Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show. Let's talk about Eastern Orthodoxy and a recent convert to Eastern Orthodoxy who shares her journey to the Orthodox Church and in the process also lays out some criticisms against Catholicism that I want to examine. I'm referring to a video by Jasmine Theodora called Why I'm Orthodox Christian. So I want to engage that. I know I've engaged one of her videos probably a year ago where I tried to offer her some guidance. Um, it seemed to me that she was very unaware of um, the Catholic perspective, but she was making very sweeping claims about it. Try to give her some perspective, and it to me doesn't look like she really took that and is once again representing um, a lot of caricatures against the Catholic Church that I want to engage. So, so that's what we're going to be doing today. And by the way, while, I, um, while I'm at it, uh, before we dive in, I want to remind you Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Help me grow this channel so that, that I can reach more people with the content that you appreciate here at Reason and Theology. So if you know that there are Eastern Orthodox out there who need to see this video, help me reach them and help me grow this channel And uh, by hitting that subscribe button and the like button while you're at it. And also, of course, leave a comment, all that good stuff. And by the way, the show is uh, sponsored by realestateforlife.org. If you're looking to buy a home, sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, and you want to support the pro-life movement at no cost to you in the process, definitely check them out, 1-877-LIFE-US-1 or realestateforlife.org. I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to dive into the video that Jasmine did about 13 days ago on her YouTube channel. She has a pretty sizable following as of right now, about over 120,000 subscribers. And in this video, a lot of people were misled. She has all kinds of very sweeping claims and also very um, grandiose claims about the Catholic Church, including that some of our dogmas are satanic. Yes, that does actually come up. She says that. Um, and also other of our teachings are heretical. And so she's making some pretty major claims. And I want to say at the outset, you can always tell a recent convert by a couple signs. Number one, it's very obvious that they begin to regurgitate things that they're told without actually knowing those things for themselves, without actually knowing the primary sources. It's very clear that she's just been coached told a few talking points, and she's ran with it, kind of in the same way that a lot of Protestants are coached. They're told a few talking points about Catholics and Orthodox, and then they just run with it. But you can tell they don't know the primary sources. You could tell they haven't actually read the Catechism of the Catholic Church or the Ecumenical Councils or maybe even the Bible. Um, you can tell when a person is just regurgitating things whenever you actually know the primary sources. And that's certainly the case here. Another thing is just the rose-colored glasses that a person might have when they are newly converted to something. They just see their current communion in the best possible light and everything else is the worst thing ever. And some of that needs to be tempered and balanced. Right now, I could tell that um, Ms. Jasmine is in the honeymoon phase with the Orthodox Church, but after a while, that's going to wear out. As, and honestly, I think she's setting herself up for failure because if she actually does a deep dive and starts to study the ecumenical councils and study Orthodox history and start to study the church fathers in depth, she's going to be shaken and alarmed and find out that a lot of the reasons why she converted to Orthodoxy instead of Catholicism turned out to be false. And that's going to disturb her. Um, it might rob her of her peace. And so what a person does when they uh, do a very poor job in analyzing other communions out there before they convert to orthodoxy is they set themselves up for failure when they actually start to study orthodox sources, which is, of course, what I did when I was Eastern Orthodox. I studied just as I said, I, when, whenever I was received into ortho, orthodoxy, I had to accept the seven ecumenical councils. Well, OK, start to read their acts, start to actually read the councils and study them in depth. And it's an eye-opening experience to see the councils accepting the papacy and accepting Catholic teachings in the first seven ecumenical councils. It's an eye-opening experience. And so what happens is, again, some of these overly zealous 
converts who have a lot of zeal but very little knowledge. They come into orthodoxy, and after a while, they become scandalized because they realize, wait, all those things that I was calling satanic actually is right here in our councils. What What's going on here? Um, so that's what I kind of want to point out today in interacting with this video. Again, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to start around the two minute, nine second mark right around there. Um, and here she's going to talk about orthodoxy as the fullness of the faith. That, that should sound familiar because that's what we Catholics say about Catholicism, right? All right, here we go. Hold some truth, the Protestant churches hold some truth, but the Orthodox Catholic Church, Catholic meaning universal, holds the fullness of truth. The fullness of truth regarding everything Christ taught during his ministry about who he is and what he wants us to have faith in. Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We believe that the... All right, there you go. So she just quoted Matthew 16, 18 through 19 to support... Eastern Orthodoxy having the fullness of the faith. Now, if you're a Catholic and you know anything about the history of Matthew 16, 18 through 19, you're scratching your head right now thinking, wait, um, that's actually a proof text for Catholicism. And you know what? You're right, because her own ecumenical councils actually confirm that. This is Nicaea II, the seventh ecumenical council. And it's not the only one that I could point to, but it's just one that I grabbed off the shelf. And you can actually see this ecumenical council that she holds to, that she believes is authoritative, and she confesses that it's authoritative in the video. This ecumenical council quotes Matthew 16, 18 through 19 in favor of Eastern Orthodoxy? No, actually in favor of the papacy and the Catholic understanding of the papacy. Yes, her own council affirms the very scripture she just used to prove Eastern Orthodoxy. It actually uses it to affirm the papacy, and the indefectibility of the papacy, and that the papacy is the head of all the churches, and that the papacy, the Pope, has the ability to bind all of the other churches to doctrine, and that it will never defect from the faith. Yes, that's her own ecumenical council. Now, again, do I expect her to be familiar with the primary sources and to know that that's actually in the acts of the Seventh Ecumenical Council? No, I don't, because again, what she's doing is she's being fed a lot of stuff from other people, presumably, perhaps even her husband, you can hear him, uh, again, I'm assuming it's him, they're um, right off camera coaching her as she makes mistakes during the video. It's pretty entertaining. Um, she's being coached by somebody, but it's clear she's unfamiliar with the sources herself. And so, again, I know I've gone over, over it many times, but I'll just do it very briefly again. Second session of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, Nicaea II, 787. This is Hadrian's letter, uh, read out loud at the council and accepted by the council fathers. They absolutely approved and accepted of it. And this that I'm going to read to you is the version that was read out loud to them. It is not the corrupted text that was corrupted decades later. This is the actual text that was read to them in their midst that they accepted. If, moreover, following the traditions of the Orthodox faith, you embrace the judgment of the Church of the Blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, and as the Holy Emperors, your pred predecessors, did of old, so you too venerate it with honor and love his vicar from the depths of your hearts. Who's the vicar? That is the Pope. That is the vicar. Um, or rather, if your rule, granted by God, follows their Orthodox faith in accordance with our Holy Roman Church, the Prince of the Apostles to whom was given by the Lord the power to bind and loose sins in heaven and earth, will repeatedly be your protector and strew all the barbarian nations under your feet, parading you everywhere as vicars. For sacred authority reveals that the marks of his, that is Peter's, dignity and how veneration should be paid to his supreme seed. By all the faithful throughout the world, the Lord appointed him as key bearer of the kingdom of heaven to be prince over all and honors him with a privilege by which the keys of the kingdom of heaven were entrusted to him. And so elevated by the supreme honor, he was worthy to profess the faith on which the church of Christ is founded. This blessed profession was followed by the blessing of a reward. It was by his preaching that the holy and universal church was made illustrious. And it was from it that the other churches of God received the proofs of the faith. 
for the blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, who was first to preside over the Apostolic See. That would be Rome. Left the primacy of his apostolate and pastoral responsibility to his successors, who are to sit in his most sacred see forever. You know, what, what you need to picture right now is that movie, The Sandlot, forever, forever. That's the key here, right? He, th this is saying that the authority that was given to Peter over the other apostles passes over to the successor in Rome, the Bishop of Rome, and that is maintained by the Bishop of Rome forever. It's not transferred. It doesn't go to Constantinople forever. And by the way, notice they're quoting... He's quoting Matthew 16, 18 through 19, and he's applying that to the papal claims of the papacy and pointing to its indefectibility. And this is just part of it. He then also speaks of Rome as your spiritual mother, the head of all the churches. And to prove that, he quotes Matthew 16, 18 through 19 as proof that Rome is head of all of the churches and that it's not going to stop being the head. And so he says this council has to accept what the Roman church accepts on the veneration of images. If it actually wants to be in communion with the Catholic church and in communion with St. Peter, because St. Peter exercises his primacy in the bishops of Rome forever. Again, there's many other things here that you can find. That's just a little tiny snippet. Many other very, very clear papal claims being made. But I just thought that that was interesting that an Eastern Orthodox would quote Matthew 16, 18 through 19 to prove that Orthodoxy and not Catholicism has the fullness of the faith. And I'm just left scratching my head. Um, even your own councils don't maintain that. Your own councils maintain that actually Matthew 16, 18 through 19 proves the papal claims. And so I think that there's an internal inconsistency here. What that shows me is that Miss Jasmine and whatever um, doctrine she has been fed is not the fullness of the faith because it doesn't even back up what her own counsels, what her own authority says is authoritative. There's an internal inconsistency here with orthodoxy, and it's not just at Nicaea II, it's also at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, it's also at Ephesus, the Third Ecumenical Council, and Chalcedon, the Fourth Ecumenical Council. In multiple places, they have an internal inconsistency on the papacy here, which she says is not something that orthodox need to believe and is heretical. But according to her own counsel, that is the standard, that is the rule. So she's being inconsistent and doesn't realize it because, again, she's just regurgitating what she's been told, a few talking points by, you know, friends, family, husband, I don't know, parish priest. But certainly it's the case that she's not familiar with the sources herself. Let's skip over to the 4 minute 27 mark. And let's take a look at her use of a Protestant argument that comes back to bite her because it absolutely, explicitly, goes against, let's see, three of her own ecumenical councils that I can think of offhand. Three of her own ecumenical councils explicitly say the exact opposite of what she's about to tell us. Let's watch it together. I'm going to share my screen once more. All right, you should be able to see it now. Let's begin from the Orthodox Church in the year 1054 after adding the filioque to the Nicene Creed in violation of the canons of the Council of Ephesus and wrongly claiming the supremacy of power of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, over the other bishops. The Orthodox Church does not recognize a universal head other than Christ. Instead, it is composed of several autocephalous, autocephalous. Churches led by patriarchs and metropolitans, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandra, Constantinople, Belgrade, Moscow, Sofia, Tbilisi, all bound together by our shared beliefs in the act of sacramental communion. The basic beliefs we... All right, let, let's just stop there. <laughs> I wanted to play the full clip before I engage that. Um, wow. Wow. In about 30 seconds, we just completely undermined our own position multiple times here. So let, let's start with multiple claims. Let, let's let's pick them apart one by one. From the Orthodox Church in the year 1054. So she says the Catholic Church schismed from the Orthodox Church in 1054. Now, no serious historian would actually say that the schism was in 1054. Why is that? Because in 1054, 
you actually did not have a full break with all of the Eastern churches in the Roman See. Plenty of Eastern churches still remained in communion with Rome well after 1054. In fact, as I've demonstrated in the lecture here on this channel, you have sharing in communion and sharing in sacraments, including the sacrament of confession, ordination, the Eucharist, and so on. You have sharing in sacraments between Catholics and Orthodox well into the mid-18th century. Mid-18th century. You know why it stopped then? Because several uh, Antiochian patriarchs privately became Catholics, and they said, oh, okay, this is a problem. <laughs> We're not going to continue to share in sacraments with them when now our own patriarchs are privately becoming Catholic. So that ended mid-18th century. But again, that just dispels this whole myth of 1054. But, you know, it's a minor point, but I bring it up because it shows that she's just regurgitating talking points that she's been fed, but it's clear she's not familiar with the actual sources herself. In fact, you can even look after 1054, letters exchanged between the emperor and others. Hey, is there an actual schism with Rome? Well, we can't actually figure out if there's really a, a schism here. We, we can't really determine if there... Right. That should show you again, 1054 is not the time of schism. You could possibly say the repudiation of the Council of Florence is what kind of sealed the deal. I, I think that that's pretty fair. But in reality, there had been a schism fomenting since the second century until the mid 18th century. That's the reality. It wasn't in just one moment. All right. But again, kind of a minor point. Let me move forward to the next part after adding the filioque to the Nicene Creed. Oh, the filioque. Well, it's not filioque, it's filioque way. Um, and then she has a pop-up on the screen, which is completely inaccurate. Um, and uh, she, she's later on going to say it's satanic because it's an inverted trinity. And she says, look at the inverted triangle. It's an inverted trinity. I'll tackle that later. But that's actually incorrect. The way this graph is depicted is a caricature of the filioque. Um, but she wants to say the filioque is what caused the schism. That's interesting. Because actually, if you look at 1054, it wasn't actually the filioque that was really a big issue. It was mentioned. But it wasn't a big issue. You know what was the big issue in 1054? Which is her date, right? I don't accept 1054 as the date of the schism. But let's use her own terms, her own claims. You know what the point of contention was in 1054? Take a wild guess. Azimes. <laughs> yeah. The use of unleavened bread versus leavened bread. Mm -hmm. That was like front center. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, I kid you not. Filioque, stuff like that. You know, that's mentioned in the background. Papacy, way in the background. Azimes, that's number one. <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous. And it's obvious that this is an atmosphere of polemics. This is not an atmosphere of mutually trying to understand each other. Um, the filioque becomes an issue partly in the ninth century. Um, when Photius contests it, really kind of as an excuse because he wasn't happy with the Pope um, for some other reasons, political reasons. He brings up the filioque as an excuse. And guess what? Photius goes back into communion with Rome before he dies and dies in communion with a Pope who believed in papal supremacy and the doctrine of the filioque. So Photius goes back into communion with a filioquist. He knows he's a filioquist, and he goes back into communion with him and dies in communion with him. Yeah, the filioque was not what really triggered a schism because Photius himself, when he brings it up in the ninth century, goes back into communion with Rome. Who holds to the filioque? It's brought up later, kind of again, as kind of an excuse to justify an existing separation that was already there for other political reasons. Um, but we're going to see in a moment when I talk more about the filioque as she brings it up, we'll see why it's even more of a problem for her 
than she realizes. Okay, now let's listen to the rest because she's now going to bring up the Council of Ephesus in relation to the Filioque, which is always a death blow for the Orthodox. They just don't realize it. It's literally a case of them shooting themselves in the foot and they don't see it. But I'm going to connect the dots for them. In violation of the canons of the Council of Ephesus. There you go. The canons of the Council of Ephesus, which is actually kind of improper to speak of the canons of Ephesus if you actually read the Acts of the Council of Ephesus, but I'll let it slide. Um, she's referring to what she would probably call Canon 7, um, at least in the way that it's enumerated um, if you look in Price, if I believe. Um, so she's referring to what Ephesus says. Whenever Ephesus says, you are not to add another symbol of faith. And what it's referring to is a different symbol of faith in contradiction to the Nicene Creed. So a rival creed that would contest and contradict the Nicene Creed. That is what Ephesus was forbidding. Why? Uh, if I recall correctly, it was actually Theodore of Mopsuestia um, who was presenting one. But um, a little fuzzy on the details. I remember somebody was presenting one and Ephesus was saying, no, you can't actually present a rival creed. Here's where, however, it shoots the, they sh the Orthodox shoot themselves in the face and shoot themselves in the, their own foot. and They don't realize it. What was the creed that Ephesus said you can't add anything to? And again, it meant anything that would rival the Nicene Creed. But they interpret that to mean you can't add any clauses to the creed which again is not what they were saying, but let's just take them at their own standards. She's saying, us adding the filioque to the Nicene Creed, it's adding a clause forbidden by Ephesus. That's inaccurate, but let's just take them at their own standard. What was the creed that Ephesus used in 433? It was not the niceno constantinopolitan Creed in 381. That was not the creed that they used. In fact, most of the churches did not use the niceno constantinopolitan Creed, which is the creed that both Catholics and Orthodox use today. Most people didn't use it even after 381. At the time of the Council of Ephesus, what creed are they using? They're, they're using the original Nicene Creed, which actually has a whole paragraph in it that is removed from the niceno constantinopolitan Creed and that we, both Catholics and Orthodox, don't profess. Well, I mean, we profess it, but we don't recite it, I should say. It removes a whole paragraph. And it also has other phrases in there that are removed. So the point is, Ephesus is saying, don't present a rival creed to that. But if we're interpreting Ephesus as saying, you can't adjust any of its clauses. Well, wait, excuse me. Excuse me. Chalcedon, who then used Constantinople 381's creed, the Niceno constantinopolitan Creed, had a problem because they had to say, wait, how does this jive with Ephesus? Ephesus is pointing us to the original Nicene Creed, and we're not using that. We're now going to promote the Niceno constantinopolitan Creed. But didn't Ephesus say that you couldn't add to the creed? You couldn't do any of these things? That was actually brought up at the Council of Chalcedon. And it's noted that, no, it's referring to a rival creed there. And that is why Chalcedon was actually able to use a creed that's different than the one the Ephesus fathers used. But if she were consistent, she would not be able to use the niceno constantinopolitan creed that Chalcedon used and that 381 used. She would have to be using the original Nicene creed, the original one that neither Catholics nor Orthodox use. But she doesn't. She's altered the creed, right? She accepts alterations to the creed. Well, that goes against Ephesus, doesn't it? Well, it goes against a certain interpretation of Ephesus, but it's an erroneous interpretation of Ephesus according to your own sources, according to your own Council of Chalcedon. But they're not thinking through these arguments. What happens is they're told these arguments, they're just regurgitating them, they're not thinking them through. It reminds me of Protestants who say, call no man father. Well, wait, hold on. Wait. Paul literally believes that he's a spiritual father for the Corinthians and calls himself that. Is Paul contradicting Jesus? No. Paul's just contradicting your interpretation of Jesus. But he's not actually contradicting Jesus. 
just your interpretation. Likewise, same thing with the filioque clause. So th this is, again, another area where I think the Orthodox, they try to score some points against the Catholics, but they don't realize the argument comes back to bite them elsewhere. And it's something you'll see over and over and over with the Orthodox. My book on Orthodoxy with Catholic Answers should be out very soon. As soon as it comes out, you'll notice every Orthodox objection that I engage in there, well over 30, every single one of them, I demonstrate and here's how this argument is inconsistent for Orthodox to use because it actually comes back to bite them elsewhere. So if they connected the dots, they would realize, wait, this isn't a good argument. If your argument against Catholics comes back to undermine you as an Orthodox, you can't use it. It's disingenuous to use it. Don't use it. Use equal measures, equal weights, as the book of Proverbs puts it. All right, let's continue. Uh, with this clip. She makes a few more claims. And wrongly claiming the supremacy of power of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, over the other bishops. The supremacy of power of the Bishop of Rome over other bishops. The problem is her own Seventh Ecumenical Council affirms the supremacy of the Pope among the bishops. That's the problem. And that's why you can even find Orthodox priests and theologians and scholars who will say, yes, Nicaea II is a triumph for the papal claims. They'll admit that because it's clear. If you look at the Acts, that is abundantly clear. And it's not just Nicaea II. It's also Constantinople III and the formula for Mrs. And so there's, again, an internal inconsistency here. Excuse me, your own ecumenical councils affirms the authority of the Bishop of Rome to bind and loose over all the other bishops. We just read it from the second session of Nicaea II. And there's many more to that letter that you can go and read where that point is highlighted. So again, they're, they're inconsistent here. The Orthodox Church does not recognize a universal head other than Christ. Instead, it is a... Okay. Yeah, so we've heard this one a million times, right? And here is an Orthodox, using a Protestant argument. This is a Protestant argument that is inconsistent and it violates three, count them, not one, not two, but three of your own ecumenical councils. Three of your own councils say otherwise. I'll read it to you again. Nicaea 2, which says it multiple times, multiple times. I'll read it to you again. Rome, as your spiritual mother, and with the other Orthodox emperors, venerated it, that is Rome, as the head of all the churches. It just said, it just said right there that Rome is head of all the churches, and that's not the only time that Nicaea II says that. Nicaea II says it in other places as well. In fact, at least two times that I can think of, it says that. It also says at Nicaea II that Jesus is head of the church. So according to Nicaea 2, Jesus being head of the church and the Bishop of Rome being head of all the churches, those aren't contradictory. In the same way that the local bishop in Orthodoxy is the head of that local diocese, and yet Jesus is also the head of that local diocese. Her husband is her spiritual head, and yet Jesus is also her spiritual head. There's no conflict here. It's a both and, not a Protestant either or. But here you have an Orthodox who decries Protestants in the video and their argumentation, but then she's using a Protestant either or argument against Catholics, and it comes back to bite her. Your own ecumenical councils say otherwise. That's just Nicaea too. Also, Ephesus 431. Ephesus makes it abundantly clear. Philip the Legate, if you just read the Acts, Philip the legate calls Rome the head, the head of those bishops who are present. Not only that, if you look at Chalcedon, first session, the legates there before all of the council fathers, the legates explicitly call, the, the legates, by the way, are the representatives of the Pope. The legates explicitly call Rome the head of the church the head of the churches. And did the fathers at, nice, at Chalcedon contest that? No. 
they had no problem with it. Just like at Nicaea too, the council fathers did not contest that either. In fact, they approved and accepted everything that the Pope had written to them. That was openly proclaimed to them in the council. So the council fathers of three different councils say that Rome is head of the churches. And it's those are just councils. I can then also point you to things outside of the councils where the Eastern saints are saying the same thing. So again, it might sound good, might sound nice to score a few points against Catholics. Yeah, we don't believe that the Pope is head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. As if somebody wants to say, no, Jesus isn't the head of the church. Of course, Jesus is the head of the church. It sounds nice. It sounds like it scores a few points, but it only scores points with the ignorant. But if you know your own councils, you can't say that because your own councils actually say the opposite of what you just said. Does she really hold to the fullness of the faith? As you can see, no, she doesn't because she doesn't even hold to the fullness of what her own councils taught, let alone, let alone the, the fullness of the faith. All right, let's continue. She makes a uh, few other claims here at the 5 minute 20 second mark. Let's go ahead and skip over to that and begin now. Earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten not made of one essence with the Father through whom all things were made. Do you see what she's doing here? You should be familiar with what she's reciting. This is the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed of 381, accepted by Chalcedon 451. What is the problem? She had just told us about how you can't add anything to the creed. And she tried to cite Ephesus for that. What's the problem with that? Well, the Creed of Ephesus was the Nicene Creed, not the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. It was the Creed from 325. And yes, she's over here reciting a creed that the Ephesus fathers did not recite. In fact, it's fairly substantially different than the ones that the Ephesus fathers recited. So if it means you can't add even a clause like and the son to the creed, then what about taking out an entire paragraph? What, what about that? And then adding a whole bunch of other paragraphs. Does that count? What's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? This is an arbitrary argument against the filioque that comes back to bite you. And we're seeing it right here and she doesn't realize it. She does, It's just doesn't register at all. Because again, regurgitating what you've been told without actually processing it, verifying it, thinking it through, thinking through these arguments more carefully, scrutinizing them, ask, hmm, am I being inconsistent here? Well, we're not doing that. Okay, let's now move over to the 6 minute 53 second mark. She's going to make a uh, comment about the me alpha sites. Let's uh, go ahead and see what she has to say there uniquely and mystically within him. We're not monophysites or miaphysites. Monophysites believe that Jesus' nature remains altogether divine and that his humanity is dissolved like tea. And miaphysites believe in a divine and human nature smoothie, essentially. We also... <laughs> smoothie, essentially. Even she couldn't take that seriously. Wow. Okay. Well, all the miaphysites watching, all the Oriental Orthodox are going to be really upset with that one. Is that what the Miaphysites believe? Yeah, no. They, they don't believe in a smoothie Christology. Um, that's going to be a caricature of the Miaphysites. Uh, they will explicitly repudiate that. You might want to look into what they actually believe before regurgitating baseless claims. Now, I'm not here to defend the Oriental Orthodox. <laughs> I think they're inconsistent on Ephesus. So I'm not here to defend them. But I'm just going to point out, this is indicative of a person who, once again, regurgitating what you've been told, you have being fed traditions of men, and instead of thinking through those traditions of men, you're just regurgitating them on YouTube. You need to do better than that. 
Um, and again, I think she's going to have a faith crisis when she finds a lot of these arguments that she used to distinguish orthodoxy from others, to decide orthodoxy from others, when she finds out that a lot of those arguments were bad and inconsistent, she's going to have a faith crisis. She's going to ask, what do I do? Did I make the wrong decision? She's setting herself up for failure. If she gets to that, that point, in fact, a lot of people never really think through their views consistently. They never really think, well, hey, where does this view lead? They might go their entire life without asking questions and thinking through their views. And they just take it by faith that whatever they've been told is accurate. They never really reflect on it. And, you know, they they die in that current belief or that belief that they had when they first converted. Uh, so she might not ever connect the dots. But if she does start to connect the dots in areas like the ones I'm pointing out, then I, she's going to have a faith crisis and she's setting herself up for failure. And she's also setting other people up who are watching this, listening to it, and who will, might take her word on this. She's setting them up for failure when they find out, wait, there was way more to this story than I realized. All right. So let's go to the eight minute, 50 second mark where she talks about an authority is needed to interpret sacred scripture. And the apostles certainly did not follow sola scriptura. We need the church as much as we need the scriptures. We need the church to give us the proper interpretation of scriptures. Leaving everyone to interpret the scriptures for themselves has led to the dozens of divided Protestant denominations we see today. So it's... All right, so that's actually a really good description of actually Eastern Orthodoxy, not just Protestantism. The argument she's using, she doesn't realize it's actually an argument against your own church, and, and you don't see that. The reason is Eastern Orthodoxy does not, on the universal level, have an authority that can bind consciences of the, the entire group of Eastern Orthodoxy. It doesn't have that universal magisterium that can bind consciences. Some people have suggested, well, yes, it does as ecumenical councils, but the problem there is identifying what an ecumenical council is. That cannot, that has not been settled in Eastern Orthodoxy, and they haven't had one in about 1,300 years. And so you might point then to, well, they have these other local synods that are binding and authoritative on others. Well, even that doesn't work because when you go to those synods, post the ecumenical councils, when you go to some of those local synods that they say is binding on all orthodox, those are the very synods that orthodox actually say are contested. Like the Council of Jerusalem, perfect example, 1672. Oh, well, here's an example of something local that's binding on all others, except orthodox are going to contest it as well. Now, orthodox don't accept what it teaches on purgatory, do they? Do they accept that? Orthodox don't accept what it teaches about the laity reading scripture, do they? Orthodox don't accept what it teaches about original sin there, do they? I know she doesn't, as we'll see here in a moment. So don't tell me, oh, well, we have these other local councils that are universally bonding, when you yourself as an Orthodox would say, no, they're actually not universally bonding. And those, those are actually contested in Orthodoxy. So without an emperor, they don't have, because they define ecumenical council, some of them at least, will define it as something called by an emperor. Others will define it differently. They'll actually call it, um, yeah, they'll identify it with the Pentarchy theory, uh, because that actually has more precedent in Nicaea too. Um, so you even have differences on what an ecumenical council is in Eastern Orthodoxy. So you can't identify what an ecumenical council is, let alone actually have one. So this whole claim, all this trying to attempt to score points against the Protestants and saying, well, you need this authority, the authority of the church to interpret scripture for you, but you don't have one that is actually binding on your conscience. They might say, well, we have the saints, we have the liturgy, we have this and that, right. And whenever somebody says, well, I don't agree with your interpretation of this part of the liturgy, or I don't agree with this aspect of the life of the saint, or you say that this life of the saint is interpreted this way, I say it's interpreted that way. You say this liturgical text is interpreted this way, I say it's interpreted that way. You say this local council is interpreted this way, I say it's interpreted that way. All of these things that they're going to point us to as standards in orthodoxy can be contested in the exact same way that Protestants contest the interpretation of Scripture. And that results then in chaos, which is why Eastern Orthodox 
currently right now have a schism internally between Moscow and Constantinople because they can't agree on the question of authority. They can't agree on the question of primacy. And so they have an internal schism on it. So I don't want to hear this stuff about, well, us Orthodox, we have this interpretive authority. You Protestants don't have it. Excuse me. From where I sit, you don't have it either. Catholics, we're the only consistent ones here. We actually have a binding magisterium that really is binding on consciences. And if people don't assent to it, well, that's because they're indecent, but they're supposed to be assenting to it. And so that standard is there. We actually have that because we have a universal church with a universal magisterium that we can actually objectively identify. And that magisterium still teaches to this day, not only in the papacy, not only in the College of Bishops outside of councils, but also in ecumenical councils. We've had 21 so far. The most recent, 1962 to 1955. Orthodox haven't had one since 7087. So this to me sounds like we're just trying to score points against the Protestants. But we're not really thinking through, does this actually work in orthodoxy? Is this really consistent? In fact, it's not. Let's go to the 9 minute 13 second mark, which is right where we're at. So we'll just continue. Uh, with the timestamp where we're currently at. It's pretty clear that Sola Scriptura is not valid. We also need the church to tell us what the canon is even composed of. For the Old Testament, the Orthodox Bible has 49 books, Catholic has 46, and Protestant has 39. There are also missing chapters. Okay. Wow. Um, see, here, here, this is just blowing me away. That somebody could regurgitate these arguments and actually never look into them. In Eastern Orthodoxy, the canon isn't settled. There are some who only accept 39 books of the Old Testament. And guess the arguments that they use to exclude the Deuterocanonicals. Take a wild guess what some Orthodox would use. The same arguments Martin Luther used to discredit the Deuterocanonicals. I kid you not. The exact same arguments. Yes, Orthodox do not have a consistent canon right now. Some would accept the Deuterocanonicals. Others will not. Take a look at the Philaret Catechism for a perfect example of that. Take a look at some strands of Eastern Orthodoxy. You'll see that. And so I'm not buying it. She's saying you have to have the canon, but excuse me, you haven't settled the canon in your own church. We have, however solemnly at the Council of Trent. We also settled it prior to that in our reunion council with the Orthodox at Florence, which she doesn't hold to. Um, and then we had local councils prior to that settling it. Uh, but if there's any doubt due to the controversy and questions that the uh, magisterial reformers raised, well, we went ahead and solemnly defined the canon. So that argument she's using right now, you have to have a canon to really you know, be able to appeal to scripture. Well, that argument actually works more for Catholics than it does for the Orthodox because the Orthodox don't actually have what she says. She just doesn't realize it yet. So it's going to be a shocker to her when she finds out that the canon question is actually still open in Orthodoxy and not all, all Orthodox agree on the status of the Deuterocanonicals. And some Orthodox will accept the status of the Deuterocanonicals. They'll accept them as part of the canon, but there's a question mark on whether or not they're inspired. So there's, there's multiple debates going on here. Whether the Deuterocanonicals belong to the canon, and if so, are they even inspired by God? There's debates here in Orthodoxy. It is not settled. Does she give you any indication of that? No, because I don't think she's aware of it herself. Let's go to the 11-minute mark uh, where we're going to get some very massive claims and um, just FYI, heresy alert, because you're about to hear the heresy of Donatism, which was condemned already in the 5th century. So we have Orthodox who are now regurgitating 5th century heresies um, and not even knowing it. When Catholics, we've moved past this 1,500 years now at this point, but some Orthodox are still struggling with a heresy that spans back 1,500 years, Donatism. All right, so you're going to see Donatism for you right here 
in the wild. Meaning that Orthodox Christians participate in certain physical acts through which God's grace works mystically for the purpose of our salvation. They are means of grace. We don't consider sacraments given by other churches to be real sacraments. Schismatic and heretical sacraments are graceless by the same principle that God did not accept the strange fire of Aaron's sons, the incense of the challengers to Aaron's priesthood, and the sacrifices made by the Samaritans. So we don't believe that there is grace involved within sacraments given by any other churches, which is a huge part of the reason why it is vital to become an Orthodox Christian. So you can participate in them and be endowed grace through them. Wow, she's been listening, or whoever's been feeding her this stuff has been listening to Peter Ayers, right? Um, <laughs> wow. Um, okay, uh, there's there's a lot going on here. First of all, again, this is the heresy of Donatism, which St. Augustine already refuted. And St. Augustine is a saint in Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, but as you know, the Orthodox have a very rocky relationship with Augustine because they don't agree with him on the filioque. Um, and they think that the uh, filioque is heresy. And so when you have one of your own saints who teaches it, yeah, it's a little odd. And so they have a rocky relationship with them, or at least recently they have a rocky relationship with them, not necessarily historically. And their own ecumenical councils actually affirm the writings of St. Augustine, which the, again, internal inconsistency here. Be that as it may, uh, this was a heresy that was long ago put to death by the great St. Augustine, and it's the claim that effectively your priest or your minister has to be in a state of grace, has to be in a right standing in order to have valid sacraments. That would include, by the way, to not be in schism. So if you're in schism, you're not in that proper state in order to have valid sacraments, i.e. Donatism. That's the Donatist heresy. And so what she's saying is that sacraments outside of the Orthodox Church are invalid because she says they are graceless graceless. I doubt very seriously she would argue for, argue for their validity, but then say that they're graceless. Usually those who argue that they're graceless also believe that they're invalid. Um, moreover, I'll point out the fact that, you know what? Uh, St. Augustine actually refuted that as well, the notion that they're graceless. While Augustine did believe in the validity of schismatic sacraments and said, if they actually are intentionally and culpably schismatic, they're receiving the grace in vain. The grace is given, but it's being received in vain. While he holds to that view, you know what else Augustine held to? Uh, some of y'all rad trads cover your ears. You're not going to like to hear this part. Well, Augustine believed if there were no Catholic churches nearby and all there was was the schismatic Donatists, that's all you have nearby. You could go to the schismatic Donatists and receive the sacraments from them, and it will be grace-filled because, and as long as, you don't intend schism in your heart. Yes, that's Augustine. That is Augustine, directly in his words, in, in his own writings, against the Donatists. One of the, in fact, it's book one against the Donatists. Um, where he's talking about the uh, the question of going to a schismatic church. Well, if there's an intention of schism, yes, you don't receive grace whenever you receive their sacraments. But he says, look, if it's a case of necessity, you don't have anything else available, and all you have is this schismatic sect, and you don't intend schism in your heart, you're receiving grace from them. Now, that would tell you Augustine doesn't believe that their great their sacraments are graceless. He just believes that though grace is offered, many people will impose a, an impediment between them and God and thus not receive the grace because they intend schism. But for those who don't intend schism, grace is offered. So she's not consistent with her own saint, St. Augustine, and she's now regurgitating the Donatist heresy, which is resurfacing its ugly head in Eastern Orthodoxy today by individuals such as Father Peter Ayers, who was recently condemned by a Rokor bishop explicitly and by name. And one of the things he condemned Peter Ayers for is this very issue that she's regurgitating.
So even Orthodox themselves don't all agree with what she's saying. In fact, traditionally, Orthodox are against what she's saying right now. They're against that. If they believed that non-Orthodox sacraments were graceless, then why is it that we had in many instances Catholics and Orthodox sharing in the sacraments until the mid-18th century? You know why? Because your view is not actually the traditional Orthodox view. The Orthodox did not believe that Catholic sacraments were graceless, which is why we were sharing in ordinations together, consecrations together, confessions together, Eucharist together, baptism together. That's why. Up until the mid-18th century, many Eastern churches, along with Catholics, Again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. You're welcome to go and watch that history. But what she's presenting to you is more of a novelty. It is not the traditional Orthodox belief, at least historically. But since in Orthodoxy, this has never been actually settled at an ecumenical council or something of that nature, you're going to have Orthodox who put it into dispute and start to say the things that she says. Because it's never been settled in an ecumenical council, they think, therefore, it's up for debate, and they can contest these things, and they end up causing all kinds of problems. And so this is one of the issues that orthodoxy is undergoing right now, is the reception of converts, how to receive them, do you rebaptize them or not? And they don't call it rebaptism, they'll refer to it under a euphemism, but that's in fact what it is, it's the sacrilege of rebaptism, and they're dealing with all these controversies. It's a scandal in orthodoxy, as Metropolitan Callistus were admitted in a video uh, not long ago before he passed away on YouTube, which seems to have been taken down. Um, and they've been unable to resolve until this day. Why? Because they don't actually have a universal magisterium that can settle the issue. So orthodoxy is going to continue to deal with this problem in the centuries to come until they return to union with Rome, where this issue is already settled. Um, let's now go to, oh, and by the way, I, I do want to point out, you do realize <clears throat> by saying that, you know, sacraments outside of Eastern Orthodox, you do realize she's saying us Catholics are basically godless pagans. That's what she's saying. Our baptisms are graceless. So we're effectively no different than a pagan who hasn't been baptized. Graceless sacraments leads to Effectively saying we're just godless pagans. Ironically, I was at a, um, uh, I was once at a uh, Coptic Orthodox liturgy, the Oriental Orthodox. Um, <laughs> and during the liturgy, they have these liturgical readings that seem to all be about condemning Chalcedon. It's so weird that literally like 1600 years later, that was the main focus of your liturgy is something that happened 1600 years ago. Um, but, but there's all kinds of polemics in the liturgy. It was a beautiful liturgy, but filled with polemics against Chalcedons uh, and the Chalcedonians. And in the liturgy, it called us godless Chalcedonians. I just thought, wow, okay. <laughs> so we're just godless to you. <laughs> all right. No, no rhetoric there. <laughs> Anyways, um, okay, let's move over to the 12-minute uh, mark where she's in inconsistently going to misunderstand original sin and condemn it uh, contrary to her own uh, Jerusalem 1672 council. Um, <laughs> let me grab a, a cup of coffee. We're almost at the uh, one-hour mark, so I'm going to take just a two-minute break, step away, grab me some coffee, and I'll be right back.
Okay, let's go ahead and continue. We are going to uh, skip to the 12 minute, 42 second mark. Let's go ahead and begin. We do not hold the baptism of infants to be heretical, but we do not believe that young children actually are sinners. We do not believe in the doctrine of original sin, meaning that that we are born as sinners, which led to the heresy of the Immaculate Conception in the Roman Catholic Church. We believe we are born with ancestral sin, meaning that we are born with a corruptible soul, not a corrupted soul. Jesus Christ himself was baptized, even though he lived a sinless life. So baptism within itself is not just about the washing away of sin. For us, it is a means of grace. It helps to protect us from evil. All right, so how much you want to bet whoever fed her this talking point has been reading Romanes, Romanides. I mean, <laughs> what you want to bet? <laughs> um, okay, so she doesn't understand original sin. She's actually in conflict with her own um, Council of Jerusalem, which, again, some Orthodox are going to say is binding on her, but then other Orthodox are going to say, no, it's not, and then they're going to contest it. And so here's another perfect example of how they lack a magisterium. Uh, but I do want to point out the inconsistency because her patriarchs signed off on this, and yet here she is completely contradicting it and coming with a straw man of what original sin is. Let's listen to it again, and I will show you the straw man. The baptism of infants to be heretical, but we do not believe that young children actually are sinners. We don't either. We don't either. Who does? Name me one person in the world. Not, not, not just, you know, in America, in the world, one person who believes that infants are sinners. Like, who believes that? Does anyone believe that? No. But nobody actually believes this. This is not what original sin is. We do not believe in the doctrine of original sin, meaning that we are born as sinners. Which nobody believes you're born as a sinner. That's not what original sin is. What is original sin? It's not an imputation that you somehow are culpable for an actual sin. No, that might be descriptive somehow of some of the reformers. That's certainly not descriptive of Catholicism. Um, what we're going to say original sin is it's a deprivation. It's a lack of something. It's a lack of sanctifying grace. It's a subjugation to something, subject to death and concupiscence, which in reality the Orthodox effectively are going to have to affirm. If you believe that a person who's an infant has sanctifying grace, you would not baptize them. So you don't believe they have sanctifying grace because you baptize them. Number two, you believe that an infant is subject to death, correct? Yeah. Okay. So they're subject to some temporal effects of Adam's sin. Yeah. You believe that. You believe that a person from their own self rises up temptations to sin. That's straight from the book of James in the New Testament. You believe that. Okay. Well, congratulations. You accept the Catholic doctrine of original sin. There you go. You already accept this. You just don't realize it. And so you come with silly arguments and then have to redefine terms and call them hereditary sin because you set up a straw man to begin with and you want to distinguish yourself from Catholics. So you then call it hereditary sin. And you're actually being inconsistent with your own counsels. Many people don't know this, but those who were denying original sin you probably know was Pelagius, right? One of his disciples was condemned by name at the Council of Ephesus, 431, her third ecumenical council, and our third ecumenical council. He's condemned by name, Celestius. By name, condemned for what? He was condemned for denying original sin. Her own Third Ecumenical Council affirms the concept of original sin and condemns a disciple of the archheretic Pelagius for denying original sin. So she's actually denying something that her own council would affirm. 
and then she's affirming something her own counsel would condemn. But she doesn't know that because she's been fed these talking points and she's just regurgitating them on YouTube. And that's what often happens with recent converts to orthodoxy. They just regurgitate things that they're told because they're given these traditions of men, which made void the word of God and contradict their own counsels and they don't know it. Inconsistent. Let's continue. To the heresy of the Immaculate Conception in the Roman Catholic Church. The heresy of the Immaculate Conception. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's going to be a shocker when she actually finds out that the substantial concept of the Immaculate Conception was affirmed in the East well before recently when they started condemning it. You know when they started condemning it? Whenever the Pope dogmatized it, that's when they started condemning it because they want to be in reaction to Rome. If Rome dogmatizes something, we're going to react to it negatively and then end up denying things that are in our own tradition. You know what the Immaculate Conception effectively boils down to? If you deny the Immaculate Conception as an orthodox, let me spell it out for you. Here's what you're actually saying. You're saying there was a time when the Virgin Mary, if she died in that moment, there was a time in which she was not in communion with God and her soul would have been damned to hell and she was under the bondage of Satan. That is what you're saying when you deny the Immaculate Conception. All we're saying is she was never, from the moment of her conception, she was never under the bondage of Satan. She was always in communion with God. That's all we're saying in really affirming in the Immaculate Conception. So when you deny it as an Orthodox, you're saying there was a point in time in which if she died in that moment, she would have gone to hell and been damned and tormented with the sinners. That's what you're saying. Now, that's absurd. I don't know any Orthodox who would actually say that. I don't Show me one Orthodox who would actually dare to say that about the Theotokos. Not one. They would probably get smacked by another Eastern Orthodox standing next to them if they said such a thing, and rightly so. So I don't know any Orthodox who would actually say that Theotokos would have been damned and she was under the bondage of Satan. Who says that? Nobody. Congratulations. You affirm the Immaculate Conception. You just don't know it. Why? Because you're in this atmosphere of polemics against reacting against Rome, and now you're undermining things in your own tradition and you just don't realize it. I would venture to guess she's never heard of the pre-purification of the Theotokos and doesn't really know the history of it. This is where I think uh, Father Christian Kappas is a really good person to consult um, about the Eastern tradition of the pre-purification of the Virgin. And that would help her understand the Immaculate Conception better. So she has a straw man of the original sin that then leads to her straw man of the Immaculate Conception. And all the while, she's actually denying something that in reality, she affirms she just doesn't know it. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and transition over to the 1323 mark and see what she has to say there. Some may say that because of the thief on the cross, that baptism is not necessary, but I'd say that the thief is an example of the exception. There are some people who may be saved without the sacraments, but most of us are in dire need of them. When I ask Ooh. Don't say that around Peter Ayers. <laughs> she, she said, you know, there, there could be an exception. Some people could be saved without the sacraments. Okay. I mean, th though I agree that a person could actually receive the grace of the sacraments without actually receiving the sacrament itself, what we would call baptism of desire or the desire of the sacraments, as the Council of Trent puts it, though I agree substantially with, with, with what she's saying, she doesn't realize she's in she's in trouble with what some Orthodox believe. And in fact, the very people that she's regurgitating the view about graceless sacraments from, she's going to be in trouble with them <laughs> for saying that, uh, for saying that somebody could actually receive grace apart from the sacraments. Okay. Even though I agree with you, good luck with that one in the circles that you seem to be hanging around. I don't think that one's going to go over very well. All right, let's go to the 19-minute mark. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here we're going to talk about how everyone is welcome in Eastern Orthodoxy. I found this part interesting. 
of hammered gold at the end of the mercy seat. Here we go. Mercy seat. How to become an Orthodox Christian. Becoming Orthodox is actually pretty simple, but it's not necessarily easy because earnest repentance is never really easy. But you simply attend a church, speak to the priest about your intentions, become a catechumen, which is basically when someone receives instruction of the basic beliefs of Orthodoxy before being baptized. Please don't be afraid of attending an Orthodox church. Everyone is always so welcoming and they'll be thrilled to see a new inquirer. All you really have to do is try to arrive early so you can briefly talk to the priest, then, then listen to the liturgy and then try to see if they have a copy of the liturgy so you can follow along with it, especially because most of the time Orthodox churches are established by an, an Eastern European immigrant. So perhaps the, uh, the liturgy will be in Russian or in, in Romanian or something. And the liturgies are often spoken entirely in the respective language, at least at least part of it. But if you attend an Antiochian or church or a Greek church, there's a good chance it'll be mostly in English or partly in English or even entirely in English. All right. So now we're touching on an aspect of orthodoxy that is hardly welcoming. So she's saying, look, you'll, you'll be completely welcome. Actually, th this is this is a problem in orthodoxy that they have to admit and they do admit. I, I found it interesting because I just reviewed that OCA survey. Orthodox Christian uh, Orthodox Church of America. And they note in the survey, one of the biggest complaints, aside from, you know, Jay Dyer and those people turning them off from Orthodoxy, one of the biggest complaints was, take a wild guess, the ethnic problem. And how people would come to Orthodox churches, and in a lot of cases, they would not be welcomed. In some cases, they were just told that they need to leave and go somewhere else. And in other cases, they would get these weird questions like um, the way the survey puts it, you, in, you know, ethnicity. <laughs> in other words, the person would come up to them and say, you Russian, you Romanian, you Bulgarian. <laughs> and others would, would come up, it says, uh, you husband ethnicity. <laughs> in other words, the people were coming up to them, you Bulgarian. Ah, you husband Bulgarian. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, what are you doing here? Are you are are you are you part of our ethnicity? Is your is your husband part of the ethnicity? Not very welcoming. And plus, having that liturgy in that language is definitely not going to be very welcoming. Um, and so, yeah, this is actually one of the areas that a lot of people experiencing Orthodoxy who have actually attended. They feel this is a big turnoff. So in reality, in some churches you might be welcome, in other churches you might not be. That's the sad reality of Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, let's go to the 2144 second mark. Let me go ahead and skip over there. Uh, we're getting kind of towards the end of the video here. Uh, here we go. All right, I'm going to share my screen once again. Uh, one second. All right, you should be able to see it now. Since and Roman Catholics discuss their beliefs because Orthodox Christians agree with both sects on certain things. For instance, we agree, agree with Protestants that the papacy is not something to believe in that indulgence. Mm. Anyone who pronounces it papacy, you already know. They don't know about the papacy, but... Minor point. She says the Orthodox believe the papacy is nothing to believe with. Excuse me. Your own ecumenical council says otherwise. Stop. Stop. You're selling us lies. You're selling us something that's inconsistent with your own councils. Read the sixth ecumenical council in Agatha's letter to the emperor read out loud. And you'll see the papacy very clearly affirmed there. And not only the papacy, but close your ears. Papal infallibility. Yes. Papal infallibility accepted at your own six ecumenical council. I'll put a link to it in the show notes where I go through Agatha's letter. Read at the council, accepted by the fathers. You'll see that explicitly. It's also affirmed here in Nicaea too. Papal supremacy and infallibility. It's also, the papacy is affirmed at Chalcedon. It's also affirmed at Ephesus. I'll have videos on all those. I'll put all of those 
uh, links in the show notes. Go and watch them. I go through the primary sources. I read the text to you. I don't just give you a YouTube video with a bunch of little talking points that I've never researched. I actually go to the text. I pull it up on the screen. I read it to you. I show it to you. I give you the sources. And you'll see the Orthodox in many instances at their own ecumenical councils, accepted the Catholic understanding of the papacy. But here she tells us the papacy is nothing to believe in. Well, why would I ever come to your church then? Because your church tells me to listen and affirm these ecumenical councils. And then these ecumenical councils affirm the papacy. And by the way, they don't just affirm the papacy up until that time. Six ecumenical council affirms the papacy unto the end forever. It's undefiled unto the end, forever. And we just saw again, Nicaea 2, forever. So don't sell me a bill of goods saying, well, you know, up until that time, it was orthodox. And so we had great things to say about it. But after that, it went into schism. And therefore, we don't accept the papacy anymore. But according to your own counsels, that can't happen. That's the problem. Um, now she says indulgences are blasphemous. No, no, they're not. Certain abuses of indulgences are blasphemous, but she sounds more like Martin Luther than she does an actual Eastern Orthodox. Um, she is now going to tell us something about the Immaculate Conception, I believe. Let's, let's listen. Indulgences are blasphemous. The Immaculate Conception is heretical. The Immaculate Conception is heretical. Okay, so let, let's just think through it. So what we're saying by the Immaculate Conception is the Virgin Mary was never under the domain of Satan and would never have been damned to hell in eternal separation from God. That's all we're saying in the Immaculate Conception. That's it. That's what we're saying. You're saying that's heretical? Okay, so you're saying there was a time in which the Virgin Mary would have been separated for all eternity from God and was under the domain of Satan? You really want to say that? Will you actually say that out loud in front of your priest? See how well that goes over. So, it, you know, again, it sounds like a well, a strong talking point for, for Protestants maybe to hear her say, well, Immaculate Conception is condemned, it's heretical. But in reality, you just condemn something that you actually affirm. You just don't realize it. But then we'd agree with Roman Catholics that the mother of God is perpetually a virgin, that the use of iconography is blessed, that you can pray to saints, etc. And then the Catholics and Protestants both believe in the filioque, which Orthodox Christians reject. Stop calling it filioque. It's not filioque. Where was her husband? Wasn't he correcting her earlier with the autocephalous thing? believe in the filioque, which Orthodox Christians reject. The filioque was actually the first heretical belief that the Roman Catholic Church embraced, which led to the schism. The filioque is the belief that... Stop. Stop. The filioque, accepted by numerous saints in Eastern Orthodoxy. Cyril of Alexandria, um... Victorinus, Ambrose, Augustine, and so on. The list goes on and on and on. Um, and in fact, up until effectively at about the sixth century, the Filioque, oh, Pope Leo the Great, an another one. The Filioque was the universal belief in the West. Like all of the West affirmed the Filioque, the doctrine of the Filioque. By the 6th century. You, we have Orthodox scholars who admit that. So all of these Western saints who are supposed to be Orthodox for hundreds of years before the schism affirmed the Filioque and the East was in communion with these Filioquist heretics. By the way, by the end of the 6th century, it's universally received in the West, right? Damascene wants to say, you can't have the entire West embracing heresy. Moreover, if that is true by the end of the 6th century, how many ecumenical councils do they affirm, Orthodox, do they affirm after the 6th century? Well, two, right? 681, 787. 
the sixth and seventh ecumenical council. Now, at those councils, they had been in communion with the Filioquus West for centuries, centuries, and it was never raised as a dispute. Centuries. And at those ecumenical councils, do they ever raise the question of the Filioque? Do they ever say, you, you Western fathers, you know, you popes over there, you're wrong for this? No. It's never raised. Why? Because it wasn't deemed heretical. That's why. It was accepted as a theological opinion. <clears throat> it was not deemed heretical. She's not accounting for that. You have an entire creed, the Athanasian creed, well in the early church in the West, affirming the Filioque. Her church was in communion with Filioquus for centuries and didn't do anything about it. There is an inconsistency here in calling it heretical because her forefathers did not believe it was heretical. Um, moreover, again, you're going to see her give a caricature understanding of the Filioque. Let's watch it together. The Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. Instead of believing that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, you can see here with this image that the Filioque actually inverts the Trinity, which is a satanic thing. Or stop. No. You literally just called Scripture satanic. Please stop it. Be careful. You just condemned Scripture as satanic. You condemned numerous Orthodox saints as satanic. Revelation 22, 1, John 16, 13, both teach the filioque. I will fight you tooth and nail over any other interpretation. It's an, the inevitable interpretation of those two verses. And that is why the Western fathers embraced it. And some Eastern fathers as well. So she has to effectively anathematize Many saints, and there's an inconsistency here because guess what? She has an entire ecumenical council that affirms the writings of St. Augustine. St. Augustine wrote about what? The Filioque in his De Trinitate work. Her own ecumenical council affirms his writings. What do we do? Also, her own, her own councils affirm Leo's letters, which also teach the papacy, by the way. Just throwing that one in as a little bonus. And by the way, he also taught, uh, taught the Filioque too, so that also causes more trouble for them. Um, okay, so the diagram issue. Let's let's look at that one last time. Diagram. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> it was right around the twenty-two forty-second mark. There. Okay. should be able to see it on your screen. This is a straw man. This is setting up a straw man because they inverse the triangle and try to see, say, see, you're inversing the order of the Trinity. Therefore, it's satanic to inverse the things of God. Well, you drew that triangle. That's not actually a result of our theology. We would do the same triangle here, the same triangle, the one that's on the left that she would affirm. We would affirm that because we're saying the sun is generated by the father. He's not at the top over here like that. He's generated by the father. Everything that the sun has comes from the father. So this is inaccurate to put them as if they're two equal things here right there. That is not the Filioque. That is a straw man of the Filioque. And she calls it satanic. So she calls something that her forefathers were in communion with in the first millennium and that is biblical and that many Orthodox saints affirmed, she calls it satanic. Golly. I'll say this, wrapping it up. There's nothing that she offered in this video that I can't receive in Eastern Catholicism as an Eastern Catholic. Nothing. Absolutely nothing.
Everything that Eastern Orthodoxy has to offer, I already have in Eastern Catholicism. But you know what else I have in Eastern Catholicism? Communion with Rome. And why is that important? Because the councils that she points me to, the ecumenical councils, affirm the papacy. And so I'm actually holding to the Eastern tradition, not she, not at least in its fullness. She says she has the fullness of the faith. Not really, according to your own counsels. You have part of the faith, but it's incomplete. If you want the fullness of the faith in its Eastern expression, you have to be Eastern Catholic. You can't receive that in Eastern Orthodoxy because it is in schism from the successor of St. Peter. You have some of the faith, but you don't have the fullness. You don't have the fullness of the Eastern tradition because the fullness of the Eastern tradition includes the necessity of remaining in communion with the successor of Peter, i.e. the Bishop of Rome. It also affirms the filioque, among other things that she den denies. Um, so again, there's nothing she offers me that I don't already have, but I actually have something she doesn't have, and that is what her own counsels affirmed, the faith of her own counsels. And thus, again, there is an internal inconsistency in Eastern Orthodoxy. And until they address it, there's really nothing that they could offer that we don't already have in Eastern Catholicism. So if you're interested in Christianity as it's expressed in the East, great. I love that. We're in the same boat. But you're going to find that only in Eastern Catholicism, not in its fullness expression in Eastern Orthodoxy. If y'all enjoy this, hit that like button and especially the subscribe button. Check me out also at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support what I'm doing here. And also check out the GoFundMe and the PayPal links there in the show notes if you would rather support me through those platforms. All right, we'll see you later. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information.